Today, we're headed to Jefferson, Texas to visit the Excelsior Hotel and to learn about the riverboat industry that built the once booming town. Texas is full of lost history, from lost cemeteries to abandoned buildings, from the infamous to the obscure. Not many people know this building's out here. Hitch a ride and travel across the Lone Star State, looking for hints of Texas' colorful past. This is the Alamo compound. Our lost history. This is Expedition Texas, and we're going to find it. Folks have been telling us for years that we need to go do expeditions in Jefferson, Texas. So we decided to take off to the small town in East Texas that was once the second largest town in the state. We don't know exactly when the town was founded, but we think someplace around 1843. This was a real lawless area back then, but uh, it needed, we discovered, one of the early founders discovered it'd be a great place. Uh, for steamboats to be able to come up because they could come up from New Orleans all the way up Mississippi to the Red River to Lake Caddo and then up uh, Big Cypress Bayou. Because the steamboats could actually get here, it became a natural river port. And the town grew from that period of time. About 1870, 72, there was a census done. And Jefferson at the time had over 10,000. It was a federal census that was done. We had over 10,000 people. And because of trading days, people would come in, the population would uh, increase to over 30,000 people during the trading days. Then along about 1878, the Red River Raft, which was basically a huge log jam on the Red River, uh, was the Corps of Engineers were able to blow it up so that they could drain the river so that the people upstream in Arkansas and all, uh, their land wouldn't flood. Well, that was the demise of Jefferson. Because in 1878, another census was done, and we had less than 2,000 people. Our first stop was the Excelsior Hotel, a big hotel in the town of Jefferson that started off as just a boarding house. This hotel has been in continuous operation since about 1848, sometime along there when uh, Captain Perry built it. Uh, it's the second oldest operating hotel in Texas, continuously operating uh, hotel, second only to the Mingus in San Antonio. Next, Harold introduced us to Laura Miller, who was going to give us the big grand tour of the hotel. Morning, how are you? Good. Harold? Yes, it All is. Right. And Laura, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. It's good to meet you. Okay, you. we're here in the courtyard at the Excelsior House Hotel in Jefferson, Texas, the second oldest continuously operating hotel in the state of Texas. Correct. That's right. That's right. It's second only to the Menger okay. in San Antonio. Today, tell us some of the things we'll be uh, seeing here at the hotel. Well, we will uh, tour you through the old part of the hotel that has a, uh, both a, a reception area and we'll get to see one of the rooms in the hotel. Then we'll take you into the new wing, which was built in 1878. Oh, the new wing. <laughs> the was new built wing, in 1878. that's right. That's right. And uh, in that area is the current reception area, a small museum room, a ballroom, a formal dining room, and perhaps we'll get out to see the sunroom for breakfast. Now I see that uh, I probably uh, dressed a little too modern yeah. for the tour today. <laughs> Tell us about the, the attire here. You first. Well, I mean, in Jefferson, one of the things we like to do is have people experience what it was like back in the 1800s. Okay. And so that's what we do. When we have some kind of event, a number of us will dress up in period costume. But tell me the story about these uh, these glasses. Well, these the rims themselves were my wife's grandfather's. Wow. Rims. And His when rims. did he wear those? Well, he wore them in the late 1800s. Really? When he, yeah, he was still wearing them when he would come from a town about 70 miles away in his ox-drawn carton to do trading here in Jefferson. He would bring cotton to Jefferson and then take goods back. You know, we were a trading for it then. So do you wear these around every day? <laughs> no, not a chance. <laughs> and I don't, I, don't guess, I don't guess you wear that every day, huh? No, I don't. It's it, beautiful it, though. Thank you. It's a, a reproduction dress and it's from, it would date from about 1860. Wow. And, uh, but, but it's, uh, 
you know, it's very nice because it has a lot of lace trim on it that right. the ladies would have worn. Absolutely. But it, the hoop is not very practical for our lives today, so we don't right. wear it every day. And, and you know, I noticed going through here, the doors are narrow. Yes. So yes. you would definitely have to get creative yes. coming through a door with that thing. Yes. And yes. might even a little Im might even be a little immodest trying to get through a door with that. <laughs> <laughs> you might be from time to time, but there are ways to gently do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay. For example, Ulysses S. Grant is has signed our register, and wow. and President Rutherford B. Hayes was in office when he signed in here. We're in Jefferson, Texas, a small town in far northeast Texas that was once booming thanks to the riverboat traffic on the Big Cypress Bayou. The swollen waters were the result of a massive log jam called the Red River Raft. The wide waterways made it possible for excellent trade days at the river port. However, the log jam was later removed due to flooding farther north. When the river port died, so did Jefferson. But one business continued to operate and led to Jefferson being rediscovered as a tourist attraction. The Excelsior House Hotel is the second longest continuously operating hotel in Texas. And today, with the help of Laura Miller, we're going to see it. You know, it feels a little bit like we're stepping back in time here. We are stepping back in time. <laughs> this uh, lobby of the hotel is the new lobby, and this was built in about 1878, if you can believe it. So that's new for us, for yeah. the hotel. <laughs> new for Jefferson is 1878. Yes. Wow. Yes. Okay. So this room, it looks like it is filled with antique furniture, and, and, and I see a whole case over here of interesting things that are archived here yes. for us to see. What, what do we have in this room? Well, in the archives are pages of our register that have important personages' names on them. Okay. For example, Ulysses S. Grant is, has signed our register. And, wow. And President Rutherford B. Hayes was in office when he signed in here. So I'm noticing that you know you have the uh, the check-in desk here. Would this yep. be original from? This is an original piece for this wing, and this uh, register holder here is the original piece for the 1854 or 1858. Book really? So this would have actually been the sign-in book. That's it from the very beginning, and so the pages that are in this uh, case over here are from this this register. This is a, a hotel register from the 8th of March in 1962. It was the dedication time when the hotel had been restored and was ready for prime time. And prime time it was when Governor and Mrs. Price Daniel checked in at 2.30 in the afternoon. Really? And they wrote, we were most honored to spend the first night in the presidential suite after the wonderful restorations. Congratulations to you and all of Texas for the preservation of our history and this great tourist attraction which you are providing us in Jefferson. So we're very proud of that, that notation. There's all of this really priceless antique furniture in this hotel. The Garden Club decided that they wanted it to be used. That's right. Not it, to be a museum. That's exactly right. We use everything that we have and we enjoy it and we want our guests to enjoy it. And so the rooms have antiques wherever we have them and they're welcome to use them. And uh, but we've had to replace some of the pieces. Our, well, our sure. current guests enjoy having a king-size bed, for example, and there were none, so we can't have an antique king-size bed. <laughs> but we have uh, antique armoires, our chairs, our other things in the rooms. In about 1920, one of the owners of the hotel was a Mr. Niedemeyer. Okay. And Mr. Niedemeyer's father was a tailor here in town. Okay. We think that this stand came from his shop. It was when the women took over the hotel in 1960, this was found in one of the rooms and it was painted black. And they took it down, but they, as they, the more they cleaned, the prettier it became, and they realized that it was quite Victorian. And wow. we think that he used this in the tailor shop, which burned down, but then yeah. Mr. Niedemeyer brought it here to the hotel. Very unusual and very nice. We're in Jefferson, Texas on a tour of the Excelsior House Hotel, the second longest continuously operating hotel next to the Minger in San Antonio. Our guide is Laura Miller, and she's showing us some of the priceless artifacts that remain for everyday use in the hotel. 
Welcome to the ballroom. Wow, this is beautiful. Isn't it lovely? I think it's sort of a, a centerpiece of culture and society in Jefferson, has been for many years. It's, uh, we have hosted dignitaries here, and I think it's just a lovely room for many occasions. It is, and I'm noticing there's, it looks like stamp 10. It is stamp 10, and this was salvaged from one of the banks here and used because the, the walls that were here when the ladies bought, the, bought it, it was not repairable, oh, and, okay. and so some of it had to be replaced, and, and it's a lovely result. What a, what a nice result, definitely. Yes. Then at the very end of the room, over a big dining table, was a huge chandelier. This thing was not wired up to the electricity in the building either. This thing was lit by candles. Now, I'm noticing this big chandelier here, and mm. we passed one back here behind yes. us. Now, that, that's electric. Yes. I've seen chandeliers like that before. This one... It's has never been electrified. It, mm. It's all candles. That's right. Of course, we don't light these candles because it's a little near the ceiling. Yes. But it is. they are both uh, features of Sev porcelain. It's a French porcelain. And they are very fine. And we have elected not to electrify the one that's over the dining table. It's just so pretty, and we wanted to leave it as it was. Now, I understand there's a story of uh, some folks coming from the famous auction house. Yes. Uh, we had a couple here from Sotheby's. Uh, in New York and they looked at it this has been quite a few years ago and they said if they were to offer that at a, a retail price it would start at one and one half million dollars Wow but our guests get to enjoy it every day that's awesome <laughs> that's awesome and you just elected to, to leave it here yes I hope yes. it's attached well Yes, uh, <laughs> there is a story about it having fallen one time oh, but, no. but not in many years now yeah. okay. Inside the Grand Ballroom were old artifacts like artwork, hand-carved tables, really nice pieces of furniture. This table is made by a man whose name is Belter. Okay. And it is uh, carved. It has no nails in it. It's all mortar and tendon. Really? And, it, and it, it's hand-carved, and there is one like it in the White House. Really? Yes, it, and uh, I understand that when one of the families was there that one of the little boys sawed off one of the ornaments underneath it. We call this the bird nest table. And ours has a mother hen and her chick. And the one at the White House has lost the chick because one of the little boys made sure it got sawed off. Sawed it off and kept it as a toy and as a souvenir, That's I guess. right, that's right. But ours is whole and we love this table and it's just a fine piece of furniture. And next, I wanted to see what everyone who comes here eventually gets to see, the rooms. This is our most requested room. It's called the Diamond Bessie Suite. Oh, really? It features depictions of uh, Diamond Bessie. Right. And the infamous Abe Rothschild. Diamond Bessie was the popular name given to Bessie Moore, a prostitute whose murder in the woods outside Jefferson, Texas, propelled her to the level of local legend. She was killed by a single gunshot wound to the head in the early afternoon of Sunday, January 21st, 1877. Her accused killer was her lover and husband, Abe Rothschild. A lot of the traffic that came into this town long before the railroads came through Texas came from the river. People used to come in off, off of river boats and, and yes, stay here. They did, and riverboat traffic was very heavy at certain times. And there is a riverboat tour this afternoon that you might enjoy. You and your boys really? might really enjoy this. Yes. So we could still go ride a riverboat? Yes. It's not a steamboat, but it's yeah. a riverboat. Okay. And Johnny Nance is the captain of his boat, and he gives you a lovely tour with good narration of the history. Really? And along the way, the water is very high right now. Okay. And along the way, you're going to see the Jefferson Ordnance Magazine, which is a wonderful Civil War relic. It's the only freestanding magazine that was used for munitions during the Civil War. It's the wow. only, only standing structure that connects East Texas to the Trans-Mississippi Department of the Confederate Army. Wow. And uh, it's a real treasure, and we're working very hard to protect it. 
against high waters like we have right yeah. now that tend to erode the riverbank. So we'll so. be able to see this today if we yes. go ride with Mr. Nance out That's right. on the riverboat. I think That's that sounds right. like part of our expedition we definitely need to take. Yes. Thank you so much for showing us around the hotel. And all this out here was covered in businesses and industries and houses and motels and honky tonks and gas stations and all kind of things until Easter Sunday of 1945 and it all washed away. We're in Jefferson, Texas, where we've just toured the Excelsior House Hotel, the second longest operating hotel in the state of Texas. Now we're heading down to where Jefferson got its start, the Big Cypress Bayou, where we'll meet riverboat captain John Nance. Well, the bayou is not as important now as it once was, but the whole reason this town is here was because of the bayou. Uh, Jefferson, that site to put the town there, was selected just because this was as far up the bayou as you could get in a steamboat. From here, you'd have to turn around and go back the other way to Louisiana. But at that time, old days, 1840s, there were no railroads in North Texas at all, so waterways had all the business, did all the business, all the freight hauling and everything. So any port that could get inland, deep inland like that, could make a lot of money, and uh, especially in Northeast Texas, where there weren't any other good waterways. We had the only dependable waterway out. And so the town was put here specifically because this was the last place big enough to turn a boat around in. John gives tours of the river here in Jefferson, takes people all along the bayou in his boat, and he has seen some history along that river. What's interesting is this is about how high the water level was back in the steamboat days. Uh, we lost the majority of our water in the 1870s here in Jefferson due to a Corps of Engineer project. In 1873, who else but the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers did a big project here and rerouted water systems. And when they got through, we lost about half the water that Jefferson was using for their shipping business. And uh, it kind of messed up the shipping business when they did that. But uh, today it comes up this high every now and then. It'll get this high and higher sometimes. But what is today our high water level is what used to be the normal water level. Of course, back in those days, the trees were cleared away. We didn't have the trees in close like we do now and all that, but uh, it is kind of interesting. Just kind of, you can kind of imagine how high the water was back, back then. And all this out here was covered in businesses and industries and houses and motels and honky tonks and gas stations and all kind of things until Easter Sunday of 1945, and it all washed away. Every single house and building over here on this side was destroyed that morning in the flood. And the land over there, got real cheap. John definitely knew some interesting history about the waterways here in Jefferson. This little brick shack here, it was built by the Confederate government as a place to store gunpowder to ship out for the army. When the Civil War came on, all the towns nearby that could make any kind of war material, then if you brought all that stuff to Jefferson, same steamboats could haul that stuff to the armies in Louisiana and Arkansas and supply those Confederate armies out over there. The gunpowder they kept in this building was not made here. It was made in Marshall. Marshall manufactured it, but they'd bring it up here from Marshall. They had three of these little buildings to keep it in. The three buildings were built 50 yards apart, and that's in case if one blew up, uh, hopefully it wouldn't get all of it. Uh, big explosion would have made a lot better story, but the other two buildings just got old and dilapidated and fell in. But they shipped gunpowder out of here until the day the mill in Marshall blew up. When the powder mill blew up in Marshall, uh, everybody went out of the gunpowder business on the same day. We could have probably spent a week looking around at all the history that's available to see in Jefferson. And the cool thing about it is it really isn't lost history. These are all things that you can come and see yourself. Jefferson, as I told you earlier, in the, in the 1840s, that long time, was a real lawless period. And so it remained kind of like that for a long time. Uh, and there's quite a lot of history about you know, some of the gunfights that went on here, one of the most famous we have was between uh, a man by the name of Robinson and another one by the name of Rose. Now, these two guys were good buddies. Now, the rest of the town didn't much care for them because they were kind of, you know, you know, ne'er-do-wells, etc. And uh, they were in a saloon at one point in time and got to arguing over a woman. And so Rose turned to Robinson and said, I'm going to kill you for that. And, you know, Rose thought, hmm, I better better watch out for him because he really seemed to get angry. So he goes, he's a blacksmith. He goes back to his blacksmith shop. He decides, well, you know, it could possible he would come back. So he gets his single shot revolver, puts it on one of his tables there. Sure enough, in comes Robinson. Robinson walks in the door and he says, 
I mean, Rose walks in the door and says, Robinson, I told you I was going to kill you. And he shoots him three or four times with a revolver. As Robinson was dying, he reaches over and grabs a single shot pistol and shoots it. Bang! Rose looks at him and says, ha, you missed me. Turns around, walks out the door, looks down, blood all over his middle. He looks at, he says, and people of town folks said this, is that they heard him say, Robinson, you done killed me, and he falls over dead. <laughs> now, that didn't end the story. Okay. What's so funny about the story, in my opinion, is, you know, I told you the town people didn't like these two guys. So they figured, well, they're already dead. What can we do to them? Well, some enterprising guy came up with a really good idea, said, we'll fix these guys for all eternity. They took Rose and Robinson, put them in a single coffin, wrapped that coffin with chain, and buried it in our local cemetery out here at Oakwood Cemetery. You can go out there now, and there is one grave, it's got two posts with a chain between it, signifying that there's where Rose and Robinson now lie for all eternity. And we saw where several past dignitaries had signed in, including presidents. It's a little, it's a little excited, a little too excited. There were presidents here. Take, I'm running out of fingers. Eight. Don't do that stuff. We could have probably sent a. It's not really a river. Okay. No, it was a. It was a uh, yeah, it's like a bayou. Bayou. But this was not a chandelier that was wired up to the electricity. Is that messing with me, that sound of that train? Okay. All right, pause it. We got to wait on that to go away.